stay hungry, stay foolish. Welcome back to part two of the exponential series here on the Innovation Show, where we explore how exponential technologies are colliding to change the business landscape and how we think. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Zai. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services, empowering its customers by making innovative financial services accessible to all. Check them out at hellozai.com. The purpose of today's book is twofold. First, to overthrow the myth that we are living in a period of change. The entire history of civilization is all about change and more than that, about technological change. This is what defines us as a species. This is what propels us forward. Change is coming faster and faster, that's for sure. And it will it likely accelerate even faster again. And second, to highlight and explain not only the benefits, but also the risks that a tech driven lifestyle throws at us. The future is already here. We're living in it. It's all around us, a present future. And in this book, we'll take a journey to discover just what that means. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to part two, episode two of this series with the author of Present Future, Business, Science, and the Deep Tech Revolution, Guy Perlmutter. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, Aidan. Good to be here. It's great to have you back on the show. And I was telling you, we've had some amazing feedback on part one. So our audience really liked this. And we're going to go again systematically through the book. And just to remind our audience, I have a copy up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovation show .io newsletter, and you'll be in with a chance to win this fantastic book. Great for an overview of all these trends, these exponential trends, but importantly, how they intertwine and work together. So the last day, Guy, we set context, and you shared the backdrop for such rapid change. We covered AI, the future of jobs, and of course, how exp exponential trends are intertwining like a Gordian knot. Today, we will sift through some of the exponential technologies that are changing the planet. Today, we'll cover IoT, Internet of Things, smart cities, biotechnology, 3D printing, virtual reality and video games, education, if we have time, there's a lot in there. So we better get going. So let's start Guy, with IoT Internet of Things. I love how you explain this starting first with the internet. And then you jump to VOIP, voice over internet protocol, then you jump to IoT. And it's also great here where you help us understand IPv4 and IPv6. Again, things that I've seen written down all the time, but I never cared to go and venture to find out what they mean. But you did it brilliantly here explaining what they mean. Perhaps you'll start here. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So uh, very few people know that uh, the origins of the internet are actually military. Uh, like so many technologies that are present in our lives, uh, the military uh, have a very, very big part in the development, into the investment, and into the uh, actual uh, proliferation of a number of technologies that we use today. So this is true for the internet, for GPS, for drones, for parallel computing, for computers themselves, and on and on and on. And back in the 50s, 1950s, the... Um, the world was already li living the post Second World War, uh, the uh, climate and Cold War, and the uh, United States didn't feel that it was wise to have a single point of failure for all their communications. So the ARPANET, which was a, a branch of the uh, military, uh, loosely speaking, uh, was the first project where they were starting to distribute computing and communication. So there was not a single point of failure. Um, and funny enough, the, uh, the, the four computers that constituted the very genesis of the internet, uh, they were all uh, in universities. They were all very academically driven. Uh, and the internet, as we know it, it only became uh, 
public and used by uh, civilians outside of universities and, and, and military institutions uh, in the mid-1990s. So it's been a relatively recent part of our lives, but again, nobody can imagine the world without it. And the whole idea behind uh, uh, the internet, once it evolved from the ARPANET to the uh, uh, internet, was that you needed a way to address each machine uh, individually, right? And so you had to have an address. And this address, it's called the IP address, Internet Protocol address. And we don't need to get very technical here, but the fact of the matter, it's that it is composed of a certain number of bits, right? Zeros and ones. Um, and when the internet was being developed and it was in its baby steps, um, I don't think anyone thought that we would run out of addresses because there were like millions and millions of address addresses available. And people felt, yeah, that will be more than enough to cover our needs. But of course, now that it's not only the computers, it's the phones and the tablets and the sensors uh, and your coffee maker and your fridge uh, and your house and your car. Now, everything that is connected, everything that is connected to the internet of things needs its own address. So people are expanding. It's almost like people said, okay, you can live in street A to Z, and your house is going to be number from one to a thousand. So someone's telling you now, okay, scratch that. Now you can live uh, on street A to Z times a thousand, and your house can be from one to a gazillion, right? Fill in the blanks, a gazillion being any number that you can think of. And so this is why the, the Internet Protocol version 6 it's so important for the Internet of Things because now you need more addresses to be able to talk to, receive information, and send information to those devices, to those things that are now connected to the Internet. And, and when I say things, I'm literally saying everything, right? It could be not only computers and electronics and household items, but also animals and plants and, and people. Uh, so everything that you can think of in the physical world can now have a presence in the virtual world, uh, receiving and sending data that can be analyzed, processed, uh, and, uh, and extrapolated. It sparked me to think about how other things worked. So for example, blockchain, the decentralized nature of that. And I was like, well, that's what they were doing with ARPANET. They were trying to decentralize communication so you weren't vulnerable and they'd spread it across the ledger. And even the whole idea of the IP address for things like in the future and probably in the present, I, I can swallow some type of nanotechnology that will swim around my body, s emit a signal and can be tracked in that way as well. And w maybe we'll come back to that when we talk about biotech. But once again, I just want to remind our audience how the purpose of these sessions with Guy and what he does in the book brilliantly, it's not just about one of these technologies. It's about how they all power each other and how they in interconnect. And again, think of IoT now controlled by AI when there's no human present, for example. We don't know what that would, <laughs> how that will pan out. But Another trend that's really important to think about when you think about IoT is urbanization. And this is the whole idea of smart cities. And I'll tee you up here, Guy, with an excerpt. You say, unprecedented urbanization will require greater efficiency and robustness in practically all cities' processes and services related to IoT and sen sensors, creating business opportunities in several different sectors like transportation, utilities, safety and environment. Large scale sensor projects will make it necessary to collect, transmit, analyze, and act on information in real time. Typically, four types of players will have critical roles equipment suppliers, telecommunications suppliers, integrators, and service managers. Maybe you'll bring us on a whistle stop tour of this one. It was only in 2015, right? Not 10 years ago, that the world became. Uh, more urban than rural. 
So uh, it was in 2015, approximately, that we officially crossed the mark of more than 50% per of the world population living in cities. And there are many trends that point to those inevitabilities we talked about in episode one, that point to more people flocking to cities as you get more uh, automiza- uh, automation in the, in the fields, more of the food production uh, is made not only in the fields, but maybe we'll talk about that being transferred to city environments and so on and so forth. So the pace with which we're seeing that, it's approximately one South Korea per annum, meaning approximately 50 million people every year are leaving their, the rural areas of the world and going into cities. And that means uh, uh, there, there's a lot of possibility in there, right? Uh, and people do that for a ton of reasons. And one of the best books I've read on the subject that I strongly recommend our, our, our audience to, to grab is called Scale by Jeff, Jeff West. He's from the Santa Fe Institute uh, and talks about why cities attract so many people and scaling issues and, of course, making more money, having a better life. Anyways, uh, when you think about that, you think about more people flocking to cities, uh, you want to make sure that the cities are ready uh, to not only uh, welcome these people, but also to uh, make living easier, healthier, and potentially more successful. So one, there's a university uh, in Spain uh, that publishes uh, in uh, Navarra, if, if I'm not wrong, they publish uh, a yearly index of smart cities where they do a great job by taking into consideration many different aspects of what constitutes a smart city. Smart city is not a city that supplies you with free Wi-Fi, right? This is, this is of course, necessary, but this is not, not by a long shot the whole story. The idea behind a smart city is that you have uh, the planning of the city for the citizens, very deliberate and leveraging technologies And those technologies, they will inevitably include uh, uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of sensors, sensors to detect pollution in the air, in the water, traffic, crime. There are cities that already have sensors, cameras, and, 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 and devices that can track and map which types of crimes happen in which parts of the city so that they can make a smart schedule for the police force so that you have at the specific time of the day uh, a specific area with more police people than uh, others. Uh, uh, energy, uh, the uh, construction materials that are being used recently, one of the uh, uh, interesting challenges that I, I was reading about uh, for the academic community was how you develop building materials that are smart in the sense that if it's too cold, they will uh, become a little less porous and they will allow the heat to be conserved. And if it is too hot, they will kind of open up almost, almost like a breathing thing and allow air to flow freely. So there are many dimensions within our world, within our environment, uh, from traffic to mobility, to infrastructure, to security, to energy, that smart cities are going to contemplate. And again, it's up to the governments, uh, the municipalities, the state government, the federal governments, to incentivize the use of sensors. Uh, And again, we're going to be dealing with privacy issues. Undoubtedly, there are many cities with cameras all around and people, you know, you have you have those concerns for what are these images going to mean? How are people going to use those images? But the fact of the matter is that this is at this point a pointless discussion. It's not like we can go back and, and remove cameras and remove sensors. It's not going to happen. We have to have smart legislation. We have to have small smart leadership to be able to deal with those uh, questions. But our lives are now going to be driven by algorithms and by sensors. And the, the closer you are to a, a metropolis, the more this is going to affect you. You mentioned leadership. And I find it so fascinating that 
if if one of the roles of leadership, whether it's leading a country or leading yourself or a startup founder or leading an organization, decisions are of the utmost importance to you. Many of our outcomes are based on our decisions and our decisions really should be based on our inputs and the more information we consume, the better in some cases, as long as it's the right information. But I say all that to say, you as a, an investor with Grids Capital, right? I think about that and go, well, Guy has written this book, he's, understand, he's understood profoundly all these different trends. Therefore, he can make much better decisions on where to place somebody, somebody's capital, his own capital as well. But equally, I go, well, I don't have much faith that there's people working in government in and in organizations making key decisions that they're uh, uh, even reading at a very high level about these trends, let alone writing about them and researching them that you have done. And I think it's so important and it needs to be almost commonplace in organizations and in governments and in investment uh, aspects and in startup founders they they can't make a decision as easily as they used to be used to in the past a hundred percent because things are changing so fast and we talked about that in the last episode now trends that you had to wait decades to 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 see them unfold they're now you know popping up and and and, and coming of age much quickly uh, so the at the end of the day, there's an expression that I think has been you know uh, overused and it now it's now beat up and it's now it's became a cliche, which is the lifelong learner uh, expression, which everybody likes to think of themselves as, as a lifelong learner. But really, to your point, uh, we're living in a world that has been so dynamic and will become even more so, you know, it's the whole exponential uh, age that you've been talking about in this brilliant series you have put together, that at the end of the day, for any leader, any person in a position of leadership to make an educated decision, maybe it's even the wrong decision, but at least it's going to be educated, it's going to be solid, there will be reasons why those decisions were made. Uh, I think a, a, a basic knowledge of those trends of those technologies is going to be imperative. And 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 to your point, this is part of the reason why I, I wrote this book because this book uh, it's very non technical. I try to you know I avoided formulas and going too deep into the weeds. But I think people walk out of it with a great sense of at least understanding and appreciation of those trends that are are, are inevitably uh, uh, becoming part of our daily lives. And I have to also take my hat off to you and all our authors that are on the show whose English is not their native language, because that is an all, another uh, appreciation I have for, for this work as well, writing in a different language as well. Uh, so, so huge plaudits to you there. Let, let's keep moving with the flow because we're only moving on to biotech. And what's interesting, again, w we need to think about biotech in the reflection of so many of the other trends, for example, we're living longer, we're adding age every year to the longevity of human beings. Then we have technology, then we have AI, we have those sensors that we can place inside our body now. So there's this marriage between medicine and technology, they're coming together. And that's causing even further lifespans and people living even more. And there's been a shift as a result in the healthcare system. Now, to the last two years aside, there's been a shift in the healthcare away from sick care to actually healthcare, and away from dealing with symptoms to looking at the cause and preventing them in the first place. You're absolutely right. There's this amazing thing happening right now, which has uh, investors uh, in, in venture capital, they always think about the total addressable market, right? When 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 we look at the technology, we think about okay, who is in this market? How big is it? How much money does this potential startup can make off of it? And I always kind of say that uh, life sciences is probably the, the the largest total addressable market because there are like seven point five billion people today interested in every single outcome. We are all vested in that in that because we want to live longer and better. 
And, 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 and actually, the marriage of technology with biology has never been more interesting. The genome project, which everybody has heard about, how we mapped the human genome, uh, and now we're able to, to tell you know, the exact structure for every single living person on Earth if we wanted to. Uh, when it was completed, when the first genome was fully sequenced, uh, the estimate is that it cost around five to six billion dollars to get that first genome, you know, completely ironed out. Today, you can get your full genome uh, 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 for a hundred bucks, right? So this has fallen. The price for that has fallen faster than any other phenomena in the industrial world. Moore's law doesn't hold a candle to the speed with which we now can get genome sequenced. But biotechnology has this amazing uh, 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 objective. It's not only diagnostics, it's not only therapeutics, it's not only drug discovery, it's not only digital health, it's all of that, right? All of the life sciences realm now becomes actively intertwined with technology in those marriages that in those Gordian knots that you mentioned that we're not going to be able to untangle uh, uh, even if we wanted to, and I don't think we want to. Uh, but the only statistic, the only figure you really have to kind of keep in the back of your mind to understand how huge this is, is the following. Uh, uh, in 2010, roughly, the world had about uh, 500 million people over the age of 65 right? That was roughly the size of the population, the global population that was 65 or more. We believe that in 2050, this number is going to be closer to 1.5 billion. So we're going to have about 15% of the global population in 2050 at the age of 65 or more. And it's not only that, right? Because when you think about someone who's 65 or 70, 50, 40, or 30 years ago, there's one image that comes to your mind. But I think all of us know people that are well into their 60s or early 70s, and they're absolutely active, and they don't look their age, and they are doing sports, and they're still working. And the implications, to your point, of longer lifespans, of people uh, having to live a uh, better quality of life, and to figure out their roles in a job market where we're going to continue to throw people in the mix. Uh, I think those implications are, are a, a very interesting challenge for regulators, for governments, for companies, uh, and for all of us to think about because it is going to happen. We'll have more people living longer uh, over the next decades uh, guaranteed. It's funny you said I, I was thinking about that. You you call it the silver tsunami. <laughs> so if this silver tsunami coming throughout the planet. But I, I was also thinking somebody asked me recently, I was a guest on somebody else's podcast for my book, and he asked me, How long do you think you're doing you're gonna do the show for? Another six years? Because I've been doing it six years. He goes, Another six years, and I was like, Hell no, I'll be doing it for another sixty. And he laughed. And I was like, oh, what, what are you laughing at? <laughs> And I was like, we're, we're going to live to at least 100 if, if disease or predation, you know, from being hit by a car or something doesn't an autonomous vehicle, maybe with the traffic lights on the back, <laughs> a truck with full of traffic lights went past if that doesn't hit me. But the whole idea here is that I'm like, I, I absolutely will be doing that because so many of the challenges we have in medicine and in healthcare will have been solved. But the most important thing there is I have to plant seeds today that will help me do that in the future, which is mind my health, invest in my mobility. So I go to I do preventative rehabilitation. So prehab, it's called every week. So I'm actually planning for that future self. Equally, I, I was asked recently, I, I do some executive coaching for some CEOs, Guy, and one of the coaches mentioned that he, he wants to retire in, you know, 10, 15 years. And I said, yeah, uh, I said, yeah, you want to get working on that now. And he's like, started laughing. I was like, no, I'm serious. I said, I'm working on that now. Because 
the likelihood is we won't want to retire and we won't want to stop producing and having a purpose in life. So we need to actually do the work now so that doesn't become such a shock on the system when we engage in that world. And this is something we mentioned the last day, because that has profound impact on stuff like pensions. It has profound impact on also the job market and how we perceive people in the job markets. I've read studies where people have been let go because they're older and they're on higher compensation. So they bring in work cheaper, cheaper labor at a lower level and then try and grow it all the way. And I was like, oh, that's so ridiculous because you're dumping so much organizational knowledge out the door that comes with that seniority. Maybe you have some thoughts on that. No, you're absolutely right. And and there is this, this huge connectivity between the IoT world and the biotechnology world, because to your point, in order to prepare for the future, uh, you try to be less reactive and more preventive. So uh, if you have sensors in your body, and we all of, we, all of us, we're going to have those running through our veins or maybe small patches or our watches, which a lot of people already use them, you can actually get early signs of disease that will allow you to treat something that you would only realize you had years, maybe decades from now, today. And this is the equivalent of what you're saying about the labor force. The, the people that are today experienced workers, people that have seen cycles and have all those co that corporate knowledge within the firm, they could be instrumental to be able to tell the next generations of the waves of change that are coming. They're almost like the sensors of those companies because they have their feet on the ground. They've seen stuff. They know how to read the signs like, you know, canneries in the coal mine, and they can help to point in the directions of what has happened. This, this, this quote is very, very old uh, and very, uh, I think, apropos. It says, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And the reason it rhymes, it's because history is always played out by us, by humans. And we have been living for thousands of years and psychologically in our brains, you know, it's love, it's lust, it's greed, it's, it's compassion, it's envy, it's rage. I mean, the emotions are there. Th these are primal emotions that are deeply, deeply encoded in our DNA. So the more we know what we're dealing with here and the more we learn from experience about the early signs of things happening, the better. So right now we have people to do that for us. But in the future, uh, the present future, uh, sensors and algorithms are going to be able to tell us, okay, this pattern right here is something I've seen before. This is the outcome. You, you may want to get ready for this potential outcome. And I think this is going to benefit us all in one level or another. I nearly took the bait of uh, going into the present future of this and going back as you do. I just want to remind our audience, this is what Guy so, does so beautifully in the book is, it's almost like he reaches back into the past and pulls something back into the present and goes, look, this was always with us. And you go deep into the history of genetics here. And uh, Friar Gregor Johan, <laughs> I won't go, I won't take the bait on it, though. But I, but I, I did want to bring it back to the decision making and back to a point you made there. So I'm, I'm becoming more preventative, which means I'm going to live older, the whole population will live longer. But you can go a step back before that almost again. And I often think about the butterfly effect or back to the future, even <laughs> I go back and I prevent something from happening. What happens then? One of the interesting ones I had Guy was, I worked with a, a med tech company. And the med tech company asked me just on the on the spot, what do you think our biggest threat is? And I go, well, what do you think it is? And they started mentioning competitors and, um, you know, people being well and not getting sick, you know, not being as sick, as, etc. And then then somebody else is going, Oh, yeah, but they'll they'll live longer. So we'll have them longer and all this kind of the customer life cycle will be longer. And I was going, No, well, actually, mine, mine is quite different. Mine is based on a technology that hasn't really become widespread because of regulation. And this goes back to a point you talked about is that all these new technologies raise questions around ethics and around regulation, for example, and oftentimes regulation is the blocking point of these 
And the, one of the ones that is like this to the point of the what's the biggest threat to medtech, I said, CRISPR technology, if I can remove sickness, before it ever even happens, what do you do then? For example, I can see this kid in the in utero as an embryo has the likelihood of developing diabetes, I remove it, the kid then doesn't have to go through a life cycle of diabetes and syringes, etc. What does that mean for you and your medical devices it means they never need them in the first place. CRISPR is a game changer. And it's something that you talk about also in the book. Yes. So CRISPR, uh, you know, trying to, to make it a, a very complex and fascinating technology, very simple. Think of it, you know, when you're when you're writing, uh, you know, a report for your work or for school or whatever, uh, and there is a word out there that you want to change or you want to make sure that you didn't repeat it too many times, you go and you press Control F in your keyboard or whatever uh, the shortcut is, and then you will locate that word and you'll be able to very precisely. Uh, you know, replace that word, you know, instead of, you know, jumping, I want to write hopping instead of screaming, I want to do shouting or whatever it is. So CRISPR is the analog uh, for the biological world, where you can take uh, a, a string of, of, of DNA, and you can locate exactly a specific part of that DNA that you want to snip out and replace. Again, the technology and how that's done is described in the book, and we'll we'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, believe me, it works, right? And the reason it works, it's because it's using, uh, and this is in the name uh, in the CRISPR acronym. Uh, it talks about uh, uh, the repetition of specific sequences that are the the, the telling tale that allows the, the tool to say, okay, this is this is the bit that I need to replace. And there is for sure an ethical discussion on where do you draw the line? Because if I can take a disease out of someone's life uh, when they're still, you know, uh, 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 even not born yet and they're still in the womb, uh, what if I also decide to use that to make them maybe a little hot taller? or make their eyes a certain color or their hair a certain way. And the, I think we will have to live through those challenges and figure out exactly the boundaries, because I think you and me and, 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 and our audience, we, we understand when the use of the technology is noble and it's going to avoid suffering and disease and pain. And when it's maybe vain and then it's maybe uh, superfluous. And I think that the legislation that will inevitably come to it and the, the race to offer the best possible services uh, is on for sure. But I think that there are conditions and there are benefits that are so clear cut because we want to avoid suffering. We want to avoid the costs of dealing with a specific disease. And there will be no shortage of diseases for people to take care of because we are going to be able, it's like, you know, we got rid of polio and measles and mumps, uh, but then we now, because we have people living longer, we'll have more cancer, we'll have more degenerative disease, neurodegenerative diseases, cognitive issues, uh, strokes. So the fact of the matter is that it's not all you know, sun and flowers, because we're going to live to be 120, our bodies, they're still going to need time to recuperate, we're going to the wear and tear of our veins and our muscles and our organs is there, uh, our brains, all of our uh, 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 systems in our own bodies, they will need maintenance, they will need replacement, maybe using 3D printing, which I know we're going to cover at some point. Uh, but but this is the CRISPR technology. It's not going to be the only one, but CRISPR, genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, all the omics out there are going to allow us to be much more precise and much more effective in our you know daily fight against disease. And I'm very excited about that. I invested in, in CRISPR and I've seen the stock plummet over the last couple of years and I'm scratching my head. And then I go, 
patience, patience, <laughs> Obi Wan. Uh, exactly, <laughs> but, exactly. <laughs> but coming back to you mentioned it there, I was going to go there three D printing because again, another question I was asked recently was uh, a food company and they're like kind of going, "What's the, what's the threat?" and and I said, "Well." Again, you can't look at the threat in isolation. So it's not, for example, uh, vegetable uh, food for a meat for a meat company. It's not non meat based food. It's not. It's not uh, the fact that there's going to be a shortage of food because maybe there's water and water is required to water the food and urbanization and people are living longer. We're going to need more food. It could be three D printing where actually somebody can 3D print the food and they don't need you to grow it anymore. That the, that presents a huge challenge for companies in the future to get their head around that. And again, when you say this to somebody, they oftentimes look at you and kind of go, nah, you're living in cloud cuckoo land here. You're too far in the future, etc." But you say the first patent applications were recorded in the 1980s for rapid pro prototyping technologies with the aim of building models of industrial equipment and components. But this is the point about exponential change. Only 10 years later, the three most important techniques had been created and all patented as well. So maybe we'll start here because you mentioned there about living longer, we might need to 3D print organs and knees, for example. But this goes way deeper. And again, once again, you reach into the past and bring it into the present. The idea behind 3D printing is fascinating because most of the, and we'll start with industrial production, most of the industrial technologies of, of pre 3D printing, they were subtractive. You began with a specific block of a specific component, and you just cut and drill and 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 model it to your uh, a specific purpose, right? Then you had the molds, right? You create a mold for a specific product, and you just uh, repeat the process uh, millions of times for for the part you're producing. 3D printing now it's it's come of age in the sense that now you can actually work with uh, no inventory in your business because any part you need, you can immediately click a button, print it and use it. Uh, and this is incredibly important for supply chains all over the world, for any industrial business, airspace, uh, transportation, general cars, trains, trucks, uh, for factories, for production goods. Uh, this, is, this is going to be massive. And as usual, with many technologies, uh, once people get aware of its existence, they feel that the process is going to happen overnight, right? And this has happened you know, time and time again. But it's a process. It takes time. And sometimes there are changes that occur due to the external environment that will either propel that technology or, or create roadblocks. So think about the world that we're living now, right? Uh, until maybe two or three years ago, pre-COVID, pre-invasion of, of Ukraine, people were thinking globalization is going to continue to grow and expand and everybody will have to deal with that. Well, now we're looking at a world where because of the pandemic, supply chain shocks with this deeper divide between you know, geopolitical spheres, people are figuring, mm -hmm, maybe this is not going to become a, a, a process that is going to go on and on forever. Maybe I'll have to have supply chains closer. Maybe I'll have to 3D print my own stuff. Maybe I'll order something online and I'll 3D print it here and I'll pay for the intellectual uh, content pay for the blueprint of the product that I will produce or print near my house or at my house, depending on, you know, how much you want to, you know, extrapolate the story. And food is no different. So food is one more field. So there's the industrials, there's food, there are organic parts, you know, we are already, there are already labs testing out skin and organs and ears that are going to be printed and jaws and bones and cartilage, which is a huge challenge that will benefit, you know, millions and millions of people that need cartilage because we don't grow cartilage as, you know, athletes painfully know if you lose cartilage, you lost it, that's it. Uh, there is no real substitute for that. 
And, and so I think that the 3D printing promise is now, again, uh, uh, to your point, I, I wanted to point out that people were working on that, you know, 40 years ago, and you're uh, tweaking and, and playing around and figuring out there's something here. And I think in another 10 or 20 years, uh, this is going to be a technology that is going to be part of our lives in so many different levels. Uh, we're still in its infancy. There's still too many tweaks to be made, but uh, but I think it's going to be one of those technologies that uh, we already have in the present, but that are going to be part of our lives uh, on a very, very intense way in the future. A few years ago, I bought my kids a 3D printer, and you know it's very, very basic. But the whole idea was I wanted them to understand it and understand that you can just close the cover and print something and and it physically appears there you know and and they're, they're so I wanted them to understand that process but then my son looked online and he's like going I found the mask Batman wears <laughs> online the design for it and he goes can you can can I buy it dad can you help me buy it so he wanted to buy it with his pocket money but I was like trying to explain to him then well that substance you have there that prints this design is not the same substance that you need. So you need to invest in a bigger printer, but great thinking, buddy. And the reason I share that is this sparks a whole new line of jobs. You mentioned creative destruction, the whole Joseph Schumpeter, loads of jobs will be destroyed by 3D printing en masse, but it will create a whole new cadre of jobs. For example, 3D printer chef, or somebody who works in a hospital who purely deals with 3D printing, etc. So th it's that it's that creative destruction that is so important to think about when you're looking at trends for the future, when you're managing legacy organizations, when you're trying to hire for capabilities that you don't yet know how would they'll manifest in the future. And and one of the things I constantly say on the show is that's why mindset is so important. The mindset, and to your point humans have always been magnificent change agents. Let's not forget that because we're capable of this change, and we'll do it again. I wanted to introduce next something that again is fascinating. And, and many of us will remember playing Atari's, for example, as kids or playing the early games, the Spectrum 64k, and then the 128k, <laughs> etc, playing the tape and that noise that we used to play in the tape. And sometimes you'd play the tape to load the game. And, all, and it wouldn't work. And you'd have to rewind and go through it all again, all those frustrations. And I love in the book how you introduce virtual reality and video games, you say, the first industrial revolution, which occurred between the second half of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th century, ushered in the entrenchment of a new society where science and log logical reasoning were gaining increasingly greater relevance. So it is no wonder the appearance of the supernatural in literature declined during this time. I thought that was really interesting. And it was precisely because of this decline that English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge used the phrase suspension of disbelief in his 1817 book, Biographia Literia. I loved how you did that. Because again, reaching into the past and go look, these concepts were there hundreds of years ago. But they just manifest as Moore's law and technology catches up with the imagination. That's absolutely right. The idea behind suspension of disbelief is pretty much what is asked of us when we step into a movie theater or when we read a book uh, that is labeled fiction, right? At some point, depending on the type of fiction, you have to let go of what you know to be, uh, you know, hard scientific fact and allow for some speculation and allow for some fantasy, allow for some creativity. And this has always been fascinating because we as humans, we love to extrapolate from the from the reality we have in our daily lives into stuff that we don't control, that we don't know too much about. That's why we're always interested in exploring and traveling and flying and diving. 
And so the idea behind the technology that is now massive, this industry, the video game industry now is bigger than cinema. And, and I think it's going to continue to grow because it became so pervasive with, you know, smartphones and tablets and consoles and computers and, and, and the virtual reality angle which can be used for training purposes and for educational purposes, uh, but also for gaming and entertainment. All those concepts, they, they intertwine. And of course, uh, I was talking to someone recently about the metaverse and people wanted to ask my opinion about the metaverse. And I say, the metaverse is a new name for something that has been around for a long time. So the idea behind Second Life, which was that game where you created an avatar and, and companies uh, set up virtual shops online and stuff. Second Life turned uh, 20 uh, recently, I think, or 21. So it's been a while since we have been living in a world where the idea of having our lives, part of our lives, not in the physical realm, but in the digital realm, is already up there, right? We have Twitter accounts and YouTube accounts and Instagram accounts and Meta accounts or whatever. So there are already parts of our lives that are more important to us online, virtually, than uh, they are in the real world. And the implications for that are tremendous. And, and we're going to talk about that when you get to the social networks part of the book and so on and so forth. But to your point, the idea behind gaming, virtual reality, and suspension of disbelief is one that I think uh, closely uh, uh, connects two worlds, the world of education uh, with games like the Oregon Trail, which was one of the first experiments that really made people realize how uh, students were responsive to learning using computers, using technology. And that's something that we're just scratching the surface off. And at the same time, you bridge that with gamification, with making sure your life and your day-to-day -day becomes more interesting and more exciting if you challenge yourself to it. And it's no surprise that many of the achievements that we are able to, uh, uh, to attain in our lives, they are always uh, accompanied by some sort of reward, points, uh, coupons, badges of honor, we are driven by a good competition, all of us. Some of us are really competitive, some of us less so, but every human being likes to be challenged and likes to uh, be rewarded by something they did. Yeah, and we'll talk about that. You mentioned the social nets. We'll come to that in a moment. But I, I just wanted to share a fascinating insight that you share in the book because many of our audience will have tried uh, 3D glasses or, or VR glasses, Google, even Google Cardboard, where there's, you know, the strange view that you look through right and left. But they will not know, many of you will not know that that tracks back to 1830, with an English scientist called Charles Wheatstone, who created the first so called stereoscopes, which was effectively a device to transform 2D images into 3D represent representations of reality. And he noticed that when two pictures designed to simulate left and right eye vi views were presented exclusively to the appropriate eye, the brain created a 3D representation by itself. That was absolutely fascinating that it stems right back to there. And they've just become mainstream again. This is why I think understanding the trends, understanding Moore's law, understanding how things progress. If you get your timing right. It's a massive competitive advantage to to jump ahead of other things. So we we won't dwell on on three D and VR. You do you mention in this chapter, and I won't go into it now. The origins of gaming, the origins, the first games that were ever produced, um, how they happened, etc. It's absolutely for anybody interested in fascinating stuff. But because you mentioned education there, one thing that sparked me to move to education was you mentioned that we already have this representation of our current reality in a virtual world in some ways, whether it be Twitter, or LinkedIn or whatever. But also as as that comes, you think you mentioned that well, in doing so, we barely have to remember a lot of information on, anymore. So we've outsourced our memory, 
in many ways to devices, to technology, that's getting faster and faster. And our attention spans and our memory spans are getting less and less. And one of those things is the phone number. So we don't really have to remember phone numbers anymore. Because now it's either some moniker somebody has, or it's just a button that we press, or even increasingly, I just speak into the phone and say, call Guy, and I'll get through to Guy. So this has a profound effect on the future of education. It does, it does. Uh, the, the study of how we learn and how we store information is fascinating. And uh, it deals with uh, neuroplasticity, how our, our, the organization of our neurons occur. Uh, we can show scientifically that uh, the brains of people that use the internet for longer or shorter periods of time, they effectively are changing the regions of the brain that are being fired. And the attention span that we get to learn something online has to be uh, recognized because there are so many distractions that are hitting us every now and then. And this very critical process of storing short-term information into the long-term memory. So it's like, in your computer, something that is stored uh, temporarily going into your hard drive or into your USB flash drive or whatever. Uh, and so the idea that we now have this, uh, you know, ubiquitous presence of, uh, of, of, of search engines and of storage and our phones and the internet effectively has made us lazy with our memory. We now don't have the incentives to learn something by heart. And I'm not advocating that at school, people should memorize a specific subject and dates and places and all that. No, but what I'm saying is that there are some muscles, you know, quote unquote, uh, around muscles in our brain about how we can navigate this world without relying solely on our phones that need to be exercised because these are muscles that play a very important part into the learning process. And if you think about school, School has been one of those uh, 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 institutions that have barely changed over the last few hundred years, right? There's, there's someone uh, in front of you spitting knowledge and you're trying to absorb it. And the way I feel that a lot of universities and schools and, 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 and fundamental primary schools are dealing with that is to trying to see how can we intertwine the technology uh, that will make learning and teaching easier and more interesting with what we know as educators about the process. Because I'm not one to advocate, you know, off with the, with the teachers, let every student do their own thing. Because one thing that people don't realize is that one of the most important parts of education is the social aspect of it, right? You learn to live with other people. It's your first experience that you're not surrounded by your parents. Normally you have, you know, students and, and other kids and you grow up and you learn to develop, you know, social skills and your teachers are going to uh, help you to hone in what you're good at, what you're not so good at. So we have to use technology to leverage this, this partnership between teachers and students. And when we spoke about the future of jobs uh, in the past episode, uh, one of the interesting things about that is that uh, one of the jobs that I think is more protected by this uh, constant evolution of technology is the job of teacher. Because this role of someone who will educate technically and emotionally in many levels is so critical for all of us. All of us, we have the memory of a special teacher or teachers that helped us out academically and personally to deal with challenges we're living then. And I think that the way the future of education is being handled right now is not as effective as it could be, because as much as we're seeing online learning exploding and people getting more access to education and to information, I think we need to be better at leveraging the human part and the technical part. And this is part of the uh, discussion that I have in that particular chapter. Well said, well said, sir. I, I have to say, I totally agree with you. And it's about learning how to learn as well, as you said before, you know, unlearning as well as relearning. So you need to unlearn the old ways. And it's not that they were 
they're broken, but they were just fit for a different time. And times have changed. So we need to unlearn first in order to relearn to and to the point of memory, in order to have cognitive capacity to hold new information as well. So that whole idea becomes so so important. But moving on, we'll try and cover um, the social nets, because you mentioned it there, you mentioned the social networks. And I, for me, I, I have a very, I, I don't have a great relationship with social networks. I, I use only really one I use LinkedIn, mainly as the show for the show to publish the show, etc. And to share articles and stuff, stuff that I hope adds value, rather than a place where my dopamine and my habits go crazy and that I develop an ego. It's not so much about that. It's more as LinkedIn is supposed to be about business and business development and sharing content that's supposed to ignite other people's thinking. That's what I use it for. But absolutely no Facebook or Instagram or anything that will basically waste my time and actually use up my dopamine. And I keep using that word because I use that in education. I lecture Guy here in Ireland as well in Trinity College. And one of the things I teach the the students about there, it's a business school, is habits and habit formation, and also the EDSO chemicals. So these neurochemicals that addict us and actually, if you use them for good, like the force can be used for good or for evil, you can actually develop positive habits and actually lean into things and create things like write a book, for example, or have a podcast or whatever it might be. Understanding that becomes so, so key. But unfortunately, what can burn up all your an ambition and your desire, and most importantly, your time is the social networks. And you have a view of social networks that encompasses the whole lot, but perhaps you'll say on a top level, from a, a from an exponential technology, what your view of social networks is? So I would rate social networks uh, as one of the top three or five risks, uh, the worst risks that we face as a society, because the way uh, people have uh, 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 leveraged these tools and let them completely take your lives away from them is, is dangerous in so many levels. So I absolutely agree with you. There is a clear benefit on LinkedIn. You can connect with other professionals. You can connect with people that you didn't know that you could reach easily through a mutual friend, and you can use that for business purposes. I also think there is value uh, in YouTube or value in Twitter or value in Instagram if you know what you're looking for, right? But the fact of the matter is that most people, when they uh, subscribe or they enroll in a social network, they really don't know what they're looking for. And to your point, every time they can see a little red dot uh, flashing on their phone, oh, there is a feedback, there's a message, there's a like, there is a comment, this hits very specific neurotransmitters, and you want more, you want more, you want more. And we go, we, we talk about that in some depth in the book. The fact of the matter is that the power of social networks uh, is exponential, which is very on, 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 on brand with, with the show right now. And it allows people to create this presence or this uh uh, the sphere of influence that they didn't know they had, hence the term influencers. But here's the twist, the sad twist in this story. We are now living in a world where your skill and your um, influence is measured not by your intellect, not by your experience, not by the fact that you've done that particular task or that particular role for a long time, it's measured instead by the number of followers you have. And this means that the expert opinion on vaccines is far less important than the opinion that someone with a large base of followers could have on the same topic. And this is where bad actors, governments and, 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 uh, and corporations and people 
are leveraging misinformation and are leveraging flat out lies and are influencing results that will impact millions of lives. And this is why I say that both cybersecurity, biotechnology, and social networks, they compose three of the biggest threats we have in our uh, brave new world driven by technology. So social networks, I think, are, are one of the key components that we need to very w- understand really well if we want to educate our children better and if we want to rein in this world of disinformation and fake news and deception that is now surrounding us uh, from, from everywhere. And it's a huge point, uh, you know, what you said there about if I'm deliberate about going looking for something, it's like, it's like going shopping when you're hungry and not having a shopping list, you'll buy loads of stuff, you know, and it's a terrible time to do it. But if I'm bored, and I go on a on a social network, terrible, unless I'm actually going for a specific reason. It's funny, you mentioned YouTube there, I didn't even think of YouTube as a social network. For me, YouTube is a learning platform because that's what all I use it for. All I use it for is learning, meditation sometimes, and for like focus music and and music, that's all. So that's, that's what it is to me. But if I was going in, for example, sometimes somebody will share a link with you. I was shared once a link on a conspiracy theory about COVID. We've all seen many of those. I clicked on it. And all of a sudden, my feed was was inundated with these videos. And and I think that's an interesting thing, because we forget, for those of us who are know there's an algorithm there that's gone, oh, he must be interested in this, I'll give him more of this stuff. We know there's an algorithm behind that. But many people don't. And all of a sudden, their worldview literally becomes just all these conspiracy theories. And as you say, I come out with a totally false impression of what's actually going on, because I'm using a platform that's driven by algorithm. Now, that's not to say that news channels don't select the news that they they give us either. But we won't go into that, man. That's a that's an entirely different book. Have you got time for one more, which is the birth of e commerce? Because you you mentioned this in the book, again, absolutely fascinating. And again, many of us won't know this because Guy shares the origins of e commerce. And you say before the acceptance of e commerce, which took a long time, as Jeff Bezos knows, a consumer who wanted a certain item had two options. One was go to the uh, to where this item was in person, or order it by mail from a catalog or via forms in printed news papers and magazines. I remember those days. But that all changed after what is considered considered to be the very first deal facilitated by the internet made in the 1970s using ARPANET, the precursor as we know now to the internet, when students at Stanford and MIT organized a marijuana sale, well ahead of the game, well ahead of the Silk Road, (laughs) well ahead of (laughs) cryptocurrencies. Maybe you'll share this. Yeah, absolutely. The the ingenuity and the way we uh, use technology uh, and bend technology to our needs uh, is a constant, right? So, uh, uh, you know, there are so many uh, 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 trivia points throughout the history of technology that show how sometimes we're using the best tools ever created by our species to, you know, to do uh, obvious tasks, simple tasks, uh, and that ultimately will surprise and will amaze some, you know, third party observer that are looking and say, this is this is how they're using this amazing tool. And, and bringing back your point about YouTube, the reason why I, I list YouTube, yes, as a social network, is because once you get in there and you have uh, a channel, right? The Innovation Show is a channel in YouTube, and people who watch Innovation Show are hopefully going to be recommended to see not only other episodes in your show, but other uh, relevant uh, uh, episodes in different shows that deal with technology, innovation, management, uh, insights, and so on and so forth. And that's a social experience because 
What do you do when you check a great video, when you check a great insight? You share it with your small network, right? You have a group of people that you trust, that you're friendly with, and you'll tell them, this is worth checking out. You should watch this. You should know this is happening. So uh, e-commerce, bringing that back to, to, to the spotlight is something that uh, started the very first test of an e-commerce transaction was was exactly as you described. And actually, uh, uh, the the times of the teletype, when we had those uh, keyboards and we spoke uh, or we typed in our TV sets, uh, that's when we really started to see the beginning of uh, a mindset of shopping offline or outside the real world and into a, a virtual world. And, and the first purchase uh, using that system was made uh, in England. Uh, I think it was a, 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 a lady well into her 80s who was the first person to buy three or four items from a, a well-known food chain in England uh, in the 1970s, late 1970s or early 1980s. Uh, and one thing that I feel that is, 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 is probably my favorite bit of trivia in the history of e-commerce that is now so obvious to all of us, right? All of us, we do online shopping all the time, is that the, the actual first purchase of an online bookstore, which was not Amazon. Amazon was not the first online bookstore. There was another uh, uh, company that bought the domain books.com. And they were subsequently bought by uh, a, a large U.S. chain of books. So if you try books.com, you'll be redirected to that new chain. This Bar Barnes and Noble you mentioned That's in the exactly book. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Barnes and Noble. But the first person to actually buy a book using a computer at the very very early days. That's 1993 or four. Uh, they started the purchase. And of course, the store owner, the virtual store owner was tracking that very, very closely with his staff. And it was taking forever for the person to kind of type in uh, and make the order. And people got anxious and they connected with this person. And they found out that this person was blind, which means that the first purchase and the uh, e-commerce era that we're now living in was of a book made online by the by a blind person and that for me is just absolutely amazing and i think it's so telling of where we as a species can kind of put ourselves into if we have the will and if we are deliberate about doing it so i really think this is a very very interesting story Beautiful, beautiful way to wrap up today's show as well. And I just want to say for anybody interested in the origins of dating sites or anything like that, Guy goes right back into the past and shows us the origins of those right back to mailing to questionnaires. Absolutely fascinating stuff. When you see the past, it makes the present seem so remarkable, but also shows you how capable we are of change. And I really love that positivity about the book, Guy, the whole way through. Again, I'll ask you, for those people who may have missed episode one, where can people find you to find out more about maybe keynotes, purchasing bulk copies of the book, and also Grids Capital? Sure. Uh, so I think you can, you know, point your, your browser to presentfuturebook.com. Uh, you can find me online on LinkedIn or on Twitter. My handle is at Guy Perlmutter. Uh, and of course, if you want to learn more about our uh, investment business, uh, it's gridscapital.com. So not a hard person to find online at all. And if you want to test your memory, don't uh, just t hit, hit Guy Perlmutter, type it into your browser, try and remember it as well. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for joining us for part two. So next part will be our finale. Maybe Guy, we might get through it all. We, di we did well today to get through the amount of content. I did leave out a few questions just to let you know. But it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, author of Present Future, Business Science and the Deep Tech Revolution. Guy Perlmutter, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Aiden. As always, I want to thank our partner, Zai. Zai is empowering us to give us more time to bring you more episodes. And it's an absolute pleasure 
to bring you this information that will hopefully help you make smarter decisions in your life and in the organizations in which we work. Zai is boldly transforming the future of financial services and powering its customers by making innovative financial services accessible to all. You can find them on hellozai.com and I'll see you next week for part three, the finale with Guy Perlmutter on his book, Present Future.